Hello, Sally and I welcome you to Streams of Living Water, flowing today from our home. Jesus once told a parable about the need to pray always and not to lose heart. And it's called the parable of the unjust judge. How do these two things go together? And how do they point us to the redevelopment of the Christian church? Today, we're going to find out. I'm Pastor David Burkadall, and my wife, Reverend Sally Welch, and I are co-producing these videos, Streams of Living Water, to provide a sense of connection and encouragement and an opportunity to reflect on what it means to be a Christian in our turbulent times. Turbulent times can refer to navigating rough waters, being pulled in many directions, threatening to take us off course, or it can refer to the work of the Holy Spirit, guiding us back to the correct course, the course that leads to life. Sally and I are retired clergy with over 80 years of ordained ministry experience between us. Bazooka Bubblegum was sold by the piece when I was growing up. It was the pink gum surrounded by a waxy comic and a waxy outer wrapper. One of the first jokes I think I ever read was on one of those waxy comics. The comic showed a cartoonishly drunk man searching under a street lamp at night just outside the curb. A police car drove by and the officer stopped and asked, hey buddy, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm looking for my keys, I lost them. And the officer gets out of his car and says, well, I'll help you. And, and he's looking around, doesn't see anything. And he said, do you know about where you lost them? And the guy said, oh yeah, down the street. And he said, well, if you lost them down the street, why are you looking for them here? And the guy said, because the light is so much better here. That joke could be read as a parable, and that parable would be pretty close to the lesson that Jesus is telling us in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. This section of the gospel takes place as Jesus travels among the small towns and villages north of Jerusalem. His 12 disciples are following him along with a couple thousand other people. And he's preparing them for what's to come. He's preparing them for his death and the life that they would experience after his resurrection and ascension into heaven. Here's the story. It starts in Luke chapter 18, 1 through 5. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. The judge was a bad judge. The requirement to care for widows and orphans and resident aliens was a significant part of Old Testament religious law. The judge didn't care. When Jesus was asked to name the greatest commandments in the Law and the Prophets, what we would call the Old Testament and what Jesus would call the Bible, Jesus answered in Matthew 22 verses 37 through 40, He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The judge didn't care about either one. Nevertheless, the judge agrees to grant her justice because she bothered him. And then comes what appears to be the point of the parable, but isn't. In Luke chapter 18, verses 6 through 8a, the first part of verse 8. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. So is the message, the squeaky wheel gets the grease? Whiners win? God answers prayers based on volume? Not exactly. Let's look at why. First, let's look at what it means to be his chosen ones who cry to him day and night. When we pray, we aren't telling anything God doesn't already know. 
Prayer is an expression of a living relationship with the one true living God, that is, faith. Faith is received. It's not achieved. It's a gift from God. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He's not telling us to be unfocused when we're driving or not really present when we're with our families. He is saying that prayer is the expression of a relationship with God, of the faith that is a gift from God to us. So when we live from our true selves in faith, when our faith defines everything about us because it defines the new creation that we have become, that faith is the substance of our prayer. That prayer is lived day and night. Second, let's look at what it means to receive justice. Justice in the Bible means to do God's will. This takes justice out of the coercive political realm and places it into a question of how God reigns. There is no delay in God's help because God is always present. And what we seek is what we pray for in the Lord's Prayer when we say, Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Evil enters the world through people like us. We struggle for justice. We pray in that living relationship of faith 24-7. And we struggle to do God's will, to make this world more like the world God intended it to be, more like the life of faith for which we were created. And ultimately, God's will will be done. But now we struggle for justice, for God's will to be done in the world. And then comes what appears to be an unrelated tag on the parable, but is the point of it in Luke chapter 18, verse 8b. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That is a chilling question, isn't it? But is that now a fair question? There's no question that Christianity, measured by numbers, is in decline in the Western world. It's said that even what is widely believed to be Christianity in the United States is, in fact, just politics by another name, both on the right and on the left. Some believe that the primary religion in the United States is, in fact, moralistic, good people go to heaven, therapeutic, feeling good about oneself is the primary purpose of life and should be protected at all costs, deism, God exists to serve my needs, but only when called upon. MTD is a form of belief that is tempting even to our struggling churches. Every church wants to grow, but I believe that, like the cartoonish drunk in the comic, we are often looking in the wrong places for the key to do so. We are looking for what we have lost in what we do now because we're familiar with the terrain. The key, however, is in another's hand. It is in the pierced hands of Jesus Christ who invites us to find our way home by following him. That is not always a popular message, especially when we might be being led to the historic faith that is now the unfamiliar terrain. Where is Jesus taking us? I think to the place where we lost the key. First, as it has been said, Jesus taught adults and played with children, and we do just the opposite. We need to refocus on teaching adults as a means for the Holy Spirit to make disciples of increasing expectations and for life transformation. It used to be said that the best way to grow a youth group was to focus on the football players and the cheerleaders. When the popular kids start to come, the rest would follow. Many churches filled with the entrepreneurial spirit believe the same. Focus on community leaders, professionals, and the affluent. When the successful people start to come, the rest will follow. Does that sound even remotely how Jesus operated? We have a path to new life to offer. Jesus is the way. Second, the world needs robust Christian communities. It needs people who can point to a path forward for the lost, the outcast, the unpopular, the needy, and the alone. For the emotionally drained, the outcast, the invisible, society's lepers, the unwanted, and for those who cry to God because they have nowhere else to go, who are beloved by God. 
For those who know they need to be saved, we have an answer. Jesus is the truth. Third, there is nowhere in the Bible that says, go build some churches. The command from Jesus is to go make disciples. We are starting from scratch with many, if not most people in our country. They aren't really interested in maintaining our buildings or our human traditions or our personal legacies. They don't need more committees. They aren't looking for political or social service groups thinly disguised as religions. We seek those who are seeking new life. We have good news for them. Jesus is the life. We don't have all the answers, but I think we have one great question that our increasingly secular country could benefit from hearing. Have you heard about Jesus? The churches of the Lutheran denomination of which I am a part took a survey of clergy and congregation leaders about five years ago. It asked them to identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats they were facing. A SWOT analysis. The responses covered 60 pages, and there were four to six page summary reports produced on each part of the acronym, S, W, O, and T. I poured over the 60 pages and read the summaries closely, and I could not find one mention of evangelism or outreach or anything like calling people to receive the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Not one. And I don't think we're alone among American Christians. Asking people the question, have you heard about Jesus, offers an antidote. It's open-ended. It allows people to reply with the doubts and misinformation they have received. It doesn't say, join my church. It says, we are all beggars and we all come to God separated by our sin. And we are all reconciled to God in the same way, in the gift given by the cross of Jesus Christ. It suggests that there is something good in Jesus, something for them. It opens the door to our witness that we are all called to new life in Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit gives it to all who will receive it, and we live it, and we all fail, and we all get up again after we stumble. God lifts us to our feet. Christ will come again, and when he does, will he find faith on earth? We have a message to proclaim. What do we have to offer the world that it can't get better someplace else? Jesus. How do we reconvert our church organizations into being Christian communities? Jesus. How will people be attracted to someone who is real, someone who speaks to their real needs and not to others' desires for them? How do we open our lives to people who are not interested in reconstituting someone else's past, but in partnering to receive God's future? That is the work of the Holy Spirit and it begins with our own reconstruction. We don't bring Jesus to people. He is already there. All we can do is to name the name, his essential reality revealed in the Holy Spirit. All we can do is make an opening with the question of our time. Have you heard about Jesus? The challenge is great, but we follow a great God. We struggle with all that would hold people back from living as the new creation we have been reconciled with God to be. We are not alone, and one day God will put all things right, and it will come not because of who we are or what we've done. It will come because of who God is and of what God has done. Meanwhile, we contend with our broken world to make it more like what God intended from the creation longing for the day of ultimate justice that is coming. One of my favorite sports quotes comes from comedian Jerry Shandling, who once reflected on Leo DeRocher, the ruthless coach of the Dodgers when they were the Brooklyn Dodgers, and who said, nice guys finish last. Gary Shandling said, nice guys finish first. And anyone who doesn't know that doesn't know where the finish line is. Justice is doing God's will. And doing God's will is an act of tenacious, trusting faith. May it grow and bring life to all. May God's justice be made manifest to all people. And may we be instruments of God for all. Come, Holy Spirit. Come.
Let us pray. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit might continue to form us and to guide us and shape us, that our prayer might be our constant expression of the living relationship of faith that you have given to us, that it might be our very being, and that in it we might in all things 24-7 give prayer, praise, and thanksgiving to you. We pray, gracious God, that all hearts may turn to you and that your ways of reconciliation and peace might be manifest among all people. May greed of all kinds come to an end. May hunger of all kinds come to an end. May your light fill every corner of this world. May the hostilities in Ukraine come to an end in a way that promotes the sovereignty and well-being of that nation. May your blessing and good be poured out upon Russia, and may they seek to do your will for all people. We ask this in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray for the people of Los Angeles and its city council, that hate might be replaced with love, that all people might know you as the way, the truth, and the life, and that it might be manifest in the direction of our city among all its people. For Dean George Pindua and his wife Esther, for our brothers and sisters in Tanzania, particularly at the New Church in Dakawa, for all those for whom our prayers have been requested, to an end to wars throughout the world, for rebuilding for the people of Haiti, for the pandemic to cease, for an end to the tragedies at our borders, and for all who are suffering as a result of recent inclement weather, and that all may come to life and peace and salvation in you. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's also remember to pray the Lord's Prayer sometime today, the one that Jesus taught us. If you don't know what that is, contact us at the Revs David and Sally at gmail.com or send us a tweet to at David Burkadal and we'll send it to you. You can send your comments, your concerns, and any questions to those same addresses and we'll respond to everyone. As always, we encourage you to stay hydrated, to allow the Holy Spirit to form and shape you and guide you and fill you and lift you up in everything every day. If you're struggling with mental health issues or having thoughts of suicide, call somebody. Contact a friend or a relative or a professional. Call a hotline. There are people all around you who will support you. You are not alone. Support your church. Support your pastor and your church leaders. Do everything you can with your time and your treasure and your talent to encourage that church to fulfill the mission God has given to it as a Christian community. And if you're not a member of a church, Talk to somebody, talk to a, a trusted advisor, pray about it, do some research, ask the Holy Spirit and follow it to guide you to the church where your gifts can best be put to use for the building of the reign of God. Remember to wear your mask or masks, wash and sanitize your hands, avoid crowds if at all possible, and if not, to maintain social distancing. But most importantly, get your vaccine, your boosters, the most recent bivalent one, to do that one thing that is the most significant in literally saving lives and moving us into the new normal that is now coming and is nearly here for all of us. Be kind to everyone you come into contact with today. Everyone you meet needs your support and encouragement. Be a person who builds others up. And now let us receive the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.